All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ian Alexander, and I head up marketing here for Telemetry, and I'm joined by Stephen Schwander, who heads up our client solutions group. Stephen, uh, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. And good morning to me. I'm out on the West Coast. Stephen's in St. Louis, and uh, we're teaming up here to talk about building consumer quality candidate experiences. Um, I think we've got a pretty good program for you here. Before we get started, a couple of things. I um, want to tell you a little bit about Telemetry. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Telemetry, we provide a recruitment marketing platform, and that works with your ATS to help you do a number of things. One is to attract more candidates with things like automated job distribution to job boards, social media sites, uh, recruiting agencies, and digital ad sources. Uh, we provide a CRM system that helps you find and engage candidates with a centralized talent pool uh, that consists of both your internal candidates, like uh, past ATS applicants, uh, as well as internal employees, but also external sources of uh, resumes, like resume databases, etc. We put that all together for you and help you create pipelines to uh, recruit against future job need, uh, source for existing jobs, and then also engage those within your talent pool with uh, mass email campaigns. And finally, what's probably most relevant today is we provide, uh, help you provide better candidate experiences uh, through rich content laden, targeted career sites um, and uh, that are mobile uh, and include mobile flexible apply processes as well. So that's a little bit about what we do, but we really want to talk about uh, candidate experiences in general. So as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, use the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar console that should be on your screen and just chat them in. Uh, most likely we'll deal with the questions at the end because, as you know, in these things, oftentimes you ask a question and it's on the next slide. So, um, but go ahead and throw those questions and even comments up as, as they occur to you, and then we'll talk about them at the end um, should we have time. So Stephen, why don't you kick, kick us off with the agenda here? Sure. So we want to talk a little bit about you know what is the candidate experience, kind of define that both broadly but then also specifically in terms of uh, online experience. We want to talk about you know why does it matter? Why is this important for us? Uh, we'd like to kind of define a consumer quality experience and and you know what it means to bring a consumer quality experience into uh, the talent acquisition and then see if we can outline some key practices for recruiting success and of course we'll leave some time at the end for some uh, some Q and a and really try and put the, the meat of the presentation on the on the key processes practices for sure so just to level set here what is candidate experience there's a lot of definitions out there for the purpose of this webinar uh, we define it as the quality of the interactions a potential candidate has with a, with a prospective employer. And we define that from the point of curiosity about working for that employer all the way through to accepted offer letter. Anything beyond offer letter, we talk about that in terms of uh, new hire experience. Um, and curiosity is pretty much the beginning of the entire, uh, the entire process. So, you know, that starts with your employer brand. What is the perception that's out there of the promise that you make in terms of what it's like to work for your company? Um, but it's things like ads, it's jobs and jobs to job descriptions. Um, it's your career site content and the navigation and design of your career site. It's your social network content and, and integration uh, with your entire recruiting process. It's the application process and the engagement that happens around uh, post-application. It's any communications that happen between your organization and the candidate. Uh, it's recruiter interactions, obviously. Um, everything logistically from scheduling to the, uh, to the environment of the interview space and, uh, you know, your lobby. Uh, and, of course, interviews and the offer itself and the communication of that offer. So with that broad definition, what we're going to focus on today is... Uh, everything that's in red there. Um, and, and the reason we're focusing on that is typically for most organizations, only a small percentage of the candidates that are interacting with you on a daily basis do you even know about. Do you have any sense of what they're doing or, or what their experience is like? So what I have here is a funnel. Uh, and within this funnel, this is taken from one of our 
clients, um, and it's a real funnel. So, and I would even be so bold as to say it's maybe a little bit better than normal funnels. Um, so it starts with a million, roughly a million views, um, and of those a million views, 111,000 are going to start an application process, and of those. 111,000 that start an application process, 26,000 are going to become applicants, finish the process. At that point, they become known to you. So out of all those millions of people interacting with you online, you are only going to get to know 3% of them if you're lucky. All right? So that's why I'm focusing on that 97% is so hugely important. Right? One of the reasons it's so hugely important is that being able to make small incremental improvements in that ratio translates into huge gains in terms of how many people you're able to interact with and get to know and, and control the experience uh, on a more granular basis, but also how many people you're able to source from and ultimately hire. So let's just change that equation a little bit and turn that 3% that ultimately engage with you in some way, whether that's through an application or other means, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's turn that into 10%. All right, so now you know 10% of the people that visit your website. Those 26,000 applicants that we saw on the previous slide now turn into almost 100,000 applicants, right? And that's just a 4% incremental increase in the number of people you're able to convert. Um, and that, but that makes a four times, a 400% increase nearly in the amount of applicants that you have. And, and, uh, and almost three times, that 600 hires turns into now almost 2,300 hires. So you get uh, almost a three times 300% increase in, in, your, uh, in your ability to hire people. So imagine what your cost per applicant and your cost per hire does, can, how it can be affected when you're dealing with such small incremental changes um, with these numbers. So look at that a little bit differently. Um, obviously, many of you have heard this before, your candidates are customers, uh, they're potential customers, they're also voters, which is important in a lot of different industries in terms of uh, affecting your ability to do business on a business, business level. They're social network commentators, and they're also potentially gold star prospects for your, for your competitors. So when you think about those numbers a little bit differently, I'll go back to the, the million views to the 617 hires. Think about that in terms of candidate satisfaction. So of all those candidates that you know and you don't know, if you hire 617 out of a million, six-tenths of 1%, you could probably make a pretty good bet that they're, they're probably pretty happy, right? So you've satisfied six-tenths of 1% of the candidates that you've interacted with. And 99.4% are somewhere between satisfied and downright angry. All right, so that's, that's why it's so important to provide the absolute best candidate experience within the, the context of what we're talking about today, that online candidate experience as you possibly can. So Ian, you know, uh, as you were looking at those numbers, I, I'm sitting here thinking about you know how much in you know the 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 picture that you've shown us, right? Uh, so much of that is uh, almost unknown, right? Or almost we might even see it outside of our sphere of influence. Uh, meaning all of those you started with 964,000 views. Um, you know, there's probably some level of frustration around the view and the start. So, uh, you know, what's that online experience look like? Is it uh, satisfying um, or is it frustrating? And I doubt very much that you'll see a whole lot of anger um, at that point in the process. Um, but what you are seeing is, is probably a lot of frustration around the candidate experience uh, where they just give up and they move off onto someplace else, as opposed to getting further down the line where you now are looking at those 26,000 applicants who you tried so difficult, uh, you know, so hard to get in. And now I think you're going to probably see some of the anger, you know, rise at that level. Now, you know, we're going to be talking about how to manage some of that unknown 
um, at the front end electronically because these are levers that we can pull as an organization with a relatively small group of people. Uh, the anger issues, um, you know, I think it's it's been shown, and this is out of scope of our conference call today, but it's been shown that those anger issues are quite often around non-communication back to uh, uh, to uh, applicants during the application process. Um, so applicants, you know, sitting out there for months and sometimes years on end with hearing, uh, you know, no responses back in terms of what their uh, status is. So it's very interesting when you look at, you know, uh, all of the levers that are available to us um, and trying to identify them, you know, which ones can we pull without a whole lot of, of uh, change management and which ones require a little bit more change management? Yes, absolutely. And we're going we're gonna to talk a bit about that. And, 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 and part of where the frustration may lie is we, we throw this term around consumer quality experience, and we're hearing that a lot both in the application world, uh, application meaning um, you know, uh, utilities, software programs, but also uh, in terms of web experiences. Um, so I kind of call this what a, you know, building consumer quality web experiences. That's all over the board. But when we talk about what is, what do we mean by a consumer quality web experience? Um, the short answer is it's mobile, and it's mobile for more than just the the fact that more people are accessing the web on mobile phones. The 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 reach and the influence and the impact of mobile technology goes beyond just the point of uh, people accessing the web on mobile. We'll talk about that a little bit more le uh, later. But you know, the big news is this year Google uh, announced that more searches are happening on mobile devices than are on web devices. So if, if you're kind of thinking, well, um, you know, mobile is cutting edge and mobile doesn't necessarily uh, apply to to the recruiting process, um, I think you're going to see here that it, that it absolutely does in significant ways. Um, so if we kind of peel back of that over 50% that uh, start their uh, searches on mobile devices, about 50% of them use, are using search engines. Um, about 33% of them are starting directly on a, a branded career site. So they're using, only 26% are using at apps, you know, what we think of as apps. So they're using their mobile devices like a desktop device in terms of how they're entering the search process and uh, interacting with the web. Now again, this is consumer quality. We're talking about consumer quality, so this is stuff like uh, autos and apparel and electronics, etc. But if you're in the recruiting process, in the recruiting world, in, in a lot of ways it's even more staggering. Um, because this is a, a, sur a survey that was done by Glassdoor, they do it every year, um, and their results are that nine in ten job seekers will be using their mobile device uh, in the next year to be to start their search process and be searching for jobs. And if you if you dig a little bit deeper into that, the issues that that uh, job seekers are finding is that the 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 search and the apply process is not very friendly to mobile devices and it's deterring them from engaging with companies online within their job uh, search. Um, so those are pretty big numbers um, and uh, they are uh, numbers that you need to pay attention to because the opportunity that's in front of you is the ability to change the way you interact online with mobile users to harvest a tremendous number of potential candidates. Depending on what kinds of jobs you hire for, it's even more important uh, to be able to engage those, those people and show that you can engage those people uh, in a mobile way. Again, we talk about consumer quality experiences. How does that manifest itself in terms of design? Um, you know, I talked about how mobile, te mobile technology has affected more than just people having a, a phone in their hand and, and, and uh, uh, investigating job searches and, and interacting with the web. It's also started to create uh, a common design language that you'll see on the web. And it's, it's, it's basically a combination of two things, that the impact of mobile on web design and the impact of, of content management systems like WordPress or Joomla or Drupal uh, that have made uh, on the, the web design process. In other words, 
catering to the mobile audience as well as being able to deploy websites in an efficient and maintainable way have both come together to make it more attractive to maybe compromise some of an organization's desire to be completely different um, in exchange for more mobile traffic and easier um, maintainability of websites. So again, this has all kind of come together to, to, to create this sort of almost sort of uh, common design uh, uh, UI that you'll see across the web. So what does that look like? That's big hero images uh, above the fold that kind of uh, are very impactful and allow you to focus people on the action that you want them to take when they hit your website. Um, in more complex environments, we have lots of content, uh, lots of different kinds of content. You'll see things like card layouts. So you see this a lot on media sites, on sites where you have lots of articles. You see this on, on uh, sites like Netflix, um, where you take chunks of content and you create little portals into those content, that content through cards. Um, you'll see long scrolls. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the days of get everything above the fold, I mean, that myth has been exploded. And really, the common design language now is long scrolls and allowing people to investigate by scrolling down as opposed to jumping between pages. And, and finally, um, what's kind of part and parcel of all of this is the, the desire to have responsive design. In other words, deploying one website that's going to recombine itself and display differently and effectively no matter what device you're on. So all those things have come together and kind of created this, again, common UI for websites that people are, are, are getting very used to. And so th the effect of that is if your career site doesn't conform to that on some level, then you're asking your traffic to learn your website, to spend more time trying to figure out how to get where they want to go. The more you can leverage a common design, the more you're making it easier for someone to then get on your site, understand it, and interact with you. So what else is a consumer quality experience? Um, filtered results, all right? So whether you are cognizant of it or not, every time you go, virtually every time you go on the web, you're getting content that's tailored directly to you. I think all of us know that when we do a Google search, we're not getting everybody's Google search responses. Uh, we're getting ours because Google collects information on us and it gives us things that maybe are close to us in proximity, maybe reflect things we've searched for in the past. So we're getting tailored results. Based on who we are, we're getting what we want to see according to Google. Same with Facebook. You know, uh, you're getting not all of your friends' posts. You're getting the, your friends' posts that Facebook's algorithm thinks that you want to see. Um, those of you who are f familiar with the term fil filter bubble, it kind of came out of this use of Facebook, that we all live online in this kind of filter bubble, that what we've done in the past is driving what we're seeing in the future. So we, we live in these little homogenous worlds where we're getting only kind of what the web wants us to see. And, and that's important on the, uh, from a career side standpoint because people are used to getting content that is tailored to them. Um, it's also important from just a general recruitment marketing standpoint that you really need to be thinking about who you're marketing to and delivering content that's relevant to them so you can penetrate that filter bubble. Um, and it, it's much harder to penetrate that filter bubble. It's difficult to get broad messages out to broad groups of people online. And then finally, I, I do the Netflix example because I went to the dentist the other day and my new dentist has you know a, a screen up above and says, hey, do you want to watch a documentary here while we... Uh, work on your teeth, and I said, or, or movie. I wanted to watch a documentary, um, but it was impossible to find because their Netflix was so completely different than mine. It was disorienting, disorienting, and I ended up having to watch uh, some child kids movie because that's all I could find. Um, so, so the message here is: consumer quality means delivering the content that's most interesting to your potential employees and candidates. So to go a little bit farther with that, it's, it's large type, it's less type. People are not reading as much. So you're going to see higher bounce rates. You're going to lose more people 
if they have to squint on their mobile device to see your particular headline or your call to action button. Um, it's prominent call to action buttons um, and it's easy conversion. All right, so if you look at the MailChimp example there, you know exactly what MailChimp wants you to do. They want to tell you who they are and they want you to sign up for a free, uh, a free uh, account. Um, if you want to sign up for Hulu, very simple sign up form and this is actually probably more complex than most. Um, there's probably eight fields there that they want you to fill out. And it's, it's again, it's recruiters thinking like marketers. What's the minimum amount of information I need to get this person into my database, my talent pool, so that I can then begin to reach out to them and get more information, learn more about them, and then ultimately get them focused on the right jobs. And again, you think back to that 90-10% or that 97-3% ratio, the benefits of harvesting more visitors at the front end of your process can be staggering in terms of results. So we talked a little bit about what a consumer quality experience is. Um, I throw this slide up, we throw this slide up in, in sort of every presentation that we do around recruitment marketing and it's, it's what we call the recruitment marketing maturity model. And we've, we've developed this over the last couple of years working with our clients and prospective clients um, and really understanding kind of where organizations are and where organizations are trying to get in terms of their ability to attract and engage and convert potential candidates uh, into great employees. Um, so we've kind of put this together. It deals with everything from you know, inbound practices. So what are you doing to attract and advertise your jobs? Uh, outbound sourcing, how, how are you proactively gathering candidates, sourcing candidates, um, engaging candidates um, through a centralized um, uh, talent pool. And then finally, what are you doing in terms of candidate experience and candidate conversion, all right? So it goes from basic to, function to mo functional to modern to optimize. Most of the organizations we talk to fit between functional and modern, um, but we do this because it's a good map to kind of see where you are and where maybe you want to get and it creates sort of a, a, a standard that you can begin to sort of discuss how to get there and sort of a common, a, a common look at it. So on the basic side, you know, that's the organization that has a, a basic career site that's kind of driven out of their applicant tracking system and a basic web apply prod, process, one size fits all, um, throw your jobs up and, uh, and uh, hope you have a good process in place. Um, when you get to more functional, now we start to see from the candidate experience and conversion side of things, we start to see things like job specific apply processes. Um, we start to see HR taking a little bit more ownership of the career site, um, maintaining the content, providing the content, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, now that you have a, a career site up, you start to think about things like search engine optimization. Is this search, is our career site in general optimized so that Google can can crawl it and, and maybe index us uh, in, the, in the search results. Then when you move to more targeted multi-channel multi uh, recruiting uh, is what we call modern recruiting. Um, from a candidate experience side, you're getting more targeted. So you're starting to see microsites underneath your global site that are targeted to key job groups, whether that's job families or departments within your organization or whether that's specific targets within your recruiting process like college recruiting or military recruiting. So then to segment your content based on who you're going after. Um, you're starting to see internal career sites. Again, along with segmentation, creating a different experience for your internal candidates and creating mobility sites for them. Social and mobile application processes start to crop up. Uh, you start to uh, really take seriously the mobile experience and, and deploy that. And then finally, um, being able to get your individual jobs search engine optimized so that your individual jobs can be crawled by not only Google but also Indeed and uh, other uh, aggregators, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so you get more visibility into your existing uh, individual jobs. And then finally optimized, that's where you're using the data that you capture uh, around how people use your site, what your conversion rates are, 
what your time on the site is, what your flow on the site is, where you might have bottlenecks, and really starting to optimize your candidate experience based on analytics data, and then uh, you know use that data to to improve your your outcome. So that's that, and we will make these slides available afterwards, so you can um, you can uh, take a look at this at your leisure because it's a lot of stuff and a lot of small type. But with that, we'll get into the keys to candidate experience success. And uh, Stephen, why don't you talk? I've been talking about it. Why don't you talk about it this time? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Why don't you pass it over to me so that I can state the obvious? So <laughs> after all of your focus on uh, on, on uh, you know, the importance of mobile, our first key to candidate experience success is to make it mobile, right? Uh, and I think as uh, Ian pointed out earlier, even more than uh, on this slide, you know, as many as 80%, if not more, candidates browse jobs on a mobile device. I mean. Um, I know I've got Indeed on my mobile device, and I've got uh, LinkedIn on my mobile device, and so I'm often starting uh, job searches, uh, you know, when I'm doing uh, research, you know, from that uh, position. Um, so it's very important. Um, I may not jump onto a specific career site, but when I hit that page, it's got to be mobile. It's got to be working, right? Um, and it's important for us also from an SEO perspective because the new search algorithms uh, at Google and other uh, search engines really favor mobile-friendly sites um, and mobile-friendly job listings. So uh, this is a key too, and, and you know, a lot of our companies are saying, okay, we know we need to be mobile. So they're creating a mobile, you know, responsive site in, uh, you know, one of these uh, uh, content management systems that Ian mentioned before, WordPress, Drupal, et cetera. Um, but they're, but then they're passing people over into an applicant tracking system front end to search for jobs. And that's not mobile friendly. Um, and frankly, you're going to get a lot more SEO from, your job content than you are from your general career content. So it's very important that this be mobile all the way through, right? Um, you know, we just typically know that companies that, you know, are lagging on technology and not being mobile is really kind of a key uh, idea there. You're going to turn off that top talent. Top talent wants to know that they're going to come to work for a company that is on the cutting edge. It's not, you know, dropping, uh, you know, back and behind. So it's important uh, mobile just kind of speaks that. Um, you want to be able to offer social profile and cloud storage options for submitting resumes. So, you know, it's not enough just to be able to parse a resume from a desktop per se, but in that application process, or let me just say a call to action process, you want to be able to give them the option to use a LinkedIn profile. Uh, if that's uh, what they want to use to start that process, um, or maybe they've got a resume or CV sitting on, um, you know, Google Drive, for instance, right? Um, so you want to make that uh, option available to them. So that's got to be mobile as well. So you got to think down to that level as well. Um, and then you want to give people on a mobile browser the option uh, to go ahead and complete this later on. Uh, so you're not losing them, and that's per that's perfectly legitimate. Well, you know, one of the t one of the funny things is if you think about it, and we don't have to say a whole lot about this. You just have to think about it and be creative. Um, we take our mobile device with us everywhere, right? So if we get you know just kind of a a, a desire to search for a job, we could be sitting uh, anywhere, um, and we might be interested in the content, but not be in a place, even if the technology works, we may not be in a place that we, you know, want to uh, complete even the simplest process. So go ahead and give them, you know, some options, right? Uh, they can email themselves later, uh, they can save it, uh, you know, they can just do a light uh, application process, come back later and finish it. So make it mobile, but think more than just responsive website design. Yeah, and if we go back to that uh, glass door slide, there's a huge number of people that report using mobile devices to sh search for jobs at work, which is probably terrifying uh, to uh, HR people, but at the same time, it's a huge opportunity. You can think of yourself as marketing to um, uh, passive candidates who might be searching for jobs or ostensibly passive candidates, um, mobile making them active. Um, at your competitor's uh, site through mobile. So it, it, it goes beyond just, you know, the numbers in terms of you can access this much more traffic if you serve them properly with mobile experiences, but strategically gets you into, uh, uh, gives you a channel into potential candidates that are employed someplace else and maybe not super actively looking for jobs. Excuse me. 
So we say this uh, this runs across all of your recruitment marketing efforts. Start with segmenting your candidates and creating personas. Personas again are maps are are profiles of your ideal candidate by job family. So go through the exercise of defining your key employee groups by job family and then creating a persona of what is that what does our ideal desired candidate look like what are they what kinds of job titles that, what do we have what title do we give them here internally what titles might they have outside of our company what do they do for hobbies um, what drives them you can look to some of your internal top performers and survey them to get information about this um, it's part data driven and it's part imagination driven to get to things like what do they do on the weekends, where do they shop, what kinds of hobbies do they have. All these things will help you at multiple different levels in the recruitment market process. But for the purposes of delivering more targeted content, uh, you really you need a basic level of persona definition by job uh, family that will help deliver that, ta that content and the relevant jobs to those particular uh, constituencies, candidate constituencies, as they uh, interact with you online. Yeah, I think jumping into that same uh, mode is then, you know, once you've segmented and targeted that that uh, uh, candidate uh, group, then how do you how do you deploy targeted messages to them? So, you know, one of the ways to do that is by actually developing targeted microsites as a part of your larger career site. So rather than having one huge career site with lots and lots of content that people probably don't want to read, uh, you can actually then deploy smaller microsites uh, with less content per se, but more targeted to what your audience wants to hear. Um, I think, you know, we heard uh, Ian's painful dentist story. Um, you know, uh, he had a different experience because he was he was uh, coming to Netflix from the dentist office as opposed to from home. Well, we should be able to have the same kind of experience, albeit not painful, <laughs> when people come to our career site. So maybe based on the keyword searches that they've delivered, maybe they land on a different microsite um, than just simply the, the, the home page, right? Um, where then we have key messages for job families, perhaps, or for locations, perhaps, um, so that we can highlight uh, some information uh, differently. Because, you know, particularly if we're making it on a mobile site, that, that content has to be lighter. Therefore, it has to be more targeted and it has to be absolutely more relevant, right? So you can highlight the relevant jobs, the relevant information for that, uh, for that audience, um, you can actually get detailed conversion tracking, so um, whatever the call to action is, if it's applying for a job or joining a talent network um, or filling out a survey, you can get uh, detailed conversion tracking for that targeted uh, site. Yeah, and that's you know an example that you talk about, Stephen, there you highlighted is kind of uh, search engine optimizing uh, individual pages within your career site targeted to uh, to specific employee groups, but uh, when people hit the front end of your site, it should be very easy to say what kind of kind of job seeker do you, what career tracker you want. Choose here, and we'll take you to a more uh, a more tailored uh, experience, both the jobs that you see and the content that we deliver to you. And then email often. Communication is huge in every part of our life, as we know, our personal lives, and as well as with our candidates. So, you know, obviously every candidate needs to be notified that their application was received. And I, I would shudder to consider that anybody on this call does not uh, touch that base. Um, but you need to sort of map out the candidate's journey within your, your hiring stages and understand what reasonable steps can we communicate with the candidate. And this is oftentimes a tricky situation, but if you do a little work and you work with your application stages within your applicant tracking system, uh, you can trigger auto emails um, at key steps. And certainly, you need to send notifications when people are not being considered and when those jobs have been filled. Now, the problem I see a lot is the candidate who applies for a job, they get notified that they've been, that the application has been received. They may even get notified that we're considering you for this particular position. They may get a second notification and then nine months later, out of the blue, 
comes uh, an email from an applicant tracking system saying, "This we've hired somebody for this job and this job has been closed. That happens more often than you uh, than you would think. And, that and those are the lucky and those are the lucky ones, Ian. Right? Some some of them don't get them at all because of the way their ATSs are configured. Right? Well, and and this doesn't happen because we all want to be rude. It happens because we get busy. Number one. Number two. A lot of times we don't want to reject uh, our top tier of candidates um, because we want to keep them warm. Because maybe you know number two and number three are really good even though they're not going to end up being number one and being chosen. So we don't want to alienate them But then, in the short run. But then we end up alienating them in the long run because they get no uh, uh, communication whatsoever uh, or they get that very terse rejection nine months later. And um, you know, a little bit out of scope from the conversation today, although maybe not, maybe this is where it actually hits, is um, you know, keeping uh, all of these uh, concepts together into a – CRM tool, right? How do you communicate with candidates, not applicants out of your ATS, but candidates? Um, and can your past applicants become candidates for future uh, experiences and, and, and future job applications? Can you see in your CRM tool how far somebody got in your ATS? Can your CRM tool identify people who have been sitting at a uh, you know, in, in in limbo for six months, so that your recruitment marketing team, who might be more sensitive to these things than your overworked recruiters are, can then segment that database and send out, you know, uh, some positive messaging. So, you know, again, just some some ideas in terms of how to maintain uh, that candidate experience and try to keep the anger level, which I think is probably higher at the end of the funnel than at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, at bay. Yeah, and I was going to say it's almost better not to send anything than send something nine months later because then you just look sort of incompetent and inept, whereas not sending anything just is probably putting you in the middle of the bell curve in terms of all the organizations out there. Um, but, yeah, neither neither option is great. And, you know, think about it, Stephen. How many organizations do we talk to day in and day out that are trying to move from a situation where they're more – reactive in their recruiting to more proactive and they're implementing those CRM systems to be able to then source from past applicants where they've had a difficult time doing that in the past with their applicant tracking system. So now they've got uh, their applicant tracking system candidates within a CRM system that they can use. Boy, wouldn't it be great if those past applicants had good experiences? Um, you know, it, it makes a huge difference on your talent pool that maybe you're not utilizing today, but I guarantee you, you will be utilizing in the future as your processes and your tools that you have access to allow you to do that, um, keeping them uh, keeping them in the loop. It's much better to, to hear bad news and be respectfully communicated throughout the process than it is to uh, be ignored or, or, you know, feel sort of minimized. And I would even say, if you have jobs or you have an, or you work in an organization where there are, there's a lot of change and jobs get opened and then they get reevaluated and then they get tabled and then they get morphed into another job. Um, create a stage within your, your applicant tracking system that is a holding stage and, and just for the purposes of communicating out to those candidates, hey, this situation on this job has changed. It's in limbo right now or however you choose to characterize it and uh, we'll get back to you if something changes. Um, that's a great way to stop that nine month process of you know suddenly out of the blue you get a rejection uh, email from a job you forgot you applied for. So take ownership. Uh, you know, consider taking more control of the process into HR and recruiting. Um, modern content management systems, as we talk about, allow recruiting organizations to take ownership of changes. And, um, and maintenance of the career site puts you kind of in charge. Uh, you can still work with internal resources, whether that be IT or marketing or, or what have you, uh, but take more control of the, uh, the career site. Um, and, uh, and it gives you more control in terms of what you're doing. Say you get more familiar with what the options you have in terms of uh, microsites and targeted content, et cetera. And then make job search prominent and intuitive. This is a huge thing that I see on so many career sites. Your jobs are what candidates are looking for. 
as much as as much as you might, may love that 360 degree view of your lobby or the you know the the, the break room video or the the case study of you know Jane in accounting who was also a rock climber those are all great things but what candidates come to your site for is your jobs so they need to be front and center I see this all the time where it's almost impossible to find a call to action to view and search for jobs so you not only need to make your job search prominent on your career site but you need to make it intuitive and effective because the better your search is in terms of someone's ability to come off the street and type in some keywords and get really to the right jobs, the higher your conversion rates are going to be and the more applicants you're going to get because you're going to be getting more people to those jobs. And unless and until you're monitoring the traffic on your career site, you have no idea how well you're able to funnel people to the right jobs. Um, so, so having all these pieces in place to be able to not only uh, do things like put your calls to action in your job search prominently on your site, but then also look to see what the results of that is in terms of uh, career site traffic flow and uh, conversion from uh, traffic to applicant to um, to completed application. Um, all those things will work together to, uh, to to significantly increase the number of applicants you get at the end of the day. Yeah, I think another one is is you know if we start talking about uh, you know relevant jobs, relevant content again, you know going back to the segmentation conversation we had before, and the segmentation also of jobs, right? So that we can group jobs around related content and, and related keywords, uh, and I think this is important because it, it's very much like we shop, right? So if I'm shopping for PCs, I'm looking for other you know related content around PCs. If you go to you know Best Buy and look for a television, they're always going to show you accessories on the side as well, so that you know they're encouraging your uh, involvement on their site. We want to do the same thing with jobs. So if you're searching for a job family, for instance, um, you can actually then provide relevant content around that specific job uh, uh, family. So it might be that somebody you know, runs a search for uh, you know, IT jobs and they land on, a, on a, a results page and now the content is around IT jobs. It gives them uh, uh, you know, relevant content in context uh, so that you're able to then share those, uh, 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 you know, share those ideas without making them you know, run around your, your, your website, uh, but also related jobs, right, and some of the testimonials. So maybe then I, I click open on an HRIS uh, project manager uh, job, and on that very job page, now I see that video of the uh, IT project, the HRIS project manager who does rock climbing, right? Or now I see some testimonies about, you know, how great it is to roll out, you know, uh, uh, new solutions for, for, uh, for HR, et cetera. So, so we see the related information right down on the job page uh, as well. Uh, we can display relevant videos there, we can re relative content, um, and we can then, uh, you know, again, push what we have to sell. Right, uh, so we treat our candidates like consumers, and what they're here to purchase is one of our jobs. And so we want to be able to get that job information out in front of them simply, easily, right, and entice them to the call to action. And speaking of calls to action, you know, simple changes in calls to action like buttons can sway response a very large amount. And the example here is let's change the color of our Get It Now button, and we've got a a 25% increase in response rate. So you need to be thinking beyond sort of just the out of the box apply here or join our talent network here. Um, uh, you know, let's get started might pull better than apply. Now it might not, but you need to be thinking in terms of testing different variations and placements of your calls to action, which is going to be job search, it's going to be talent network, it's going to be apply for jobs because those can make uh, big changes in response rate. One of the things I like to um, encourage people to do, although I realize it's really difficult to do, um, but to try to make job titles relevant to the target audience. Um, and and the, the reason I say this is because, again, if you remember back when we talked about most, uh, uh, most candidates will start their job search uh, on a mobile device, and they will probably not start that job search on your career site per se, um, unless they have a reason to do so. Uh, so they may start at Indeed, and, or they may start at Beyond, Simply Hired, you name it, right? 
and when they click that and they begin to see the long list of jobs, um, what in your job title is going to get them to click on that one instead of somebody else's job title, right? So if you can craft titles that are relevant to the outside world, number one, so they don't have that, you know, really, uh, you know, internal HRIS -E kind of feel, right? Um, and, and number two, you know, maybe have a little bit of an emotional appeal, right? Or emotive appeal uh, that says, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, I think one of my favorite television ads now on, on uh, employment is uh, General Electric, uh, you know, where you have this kid who's uh, all excited he's going to work for General Electric and his really cool Java developer friends think he's, you know, stupid for going to work for a manufacturing company and his parents think it's great he's going to work for a manufacturing company but he can't lift up a, a heavy hammer. Um, I mean, here's a kid who's fallen in love with a job that probably if it just said, you know, uh, Java developer level three, uh, he might not have he might not have applied to it. But changing the way the world works, that's what's gotten him to apply for that job. So um, I don't know how we do that. Um, it's a, it's it's an operational challenge. I understand. Um, I've run recruitment operations for uh, global 500 companies. I know it's difficult, um, but I would I, this would go a long long ways. Great. And we are getting a little bit short on time here, so we're gonna we're gonna pick up the pace a bit. But uh, uh, finally, here related to that, craft realistic and compelling job ads for for a couple of different reasons. For kind of what Stephen was talking about, you want to make your job ads compelling and inspiring. Um, but to kind of go beyond, and this is key, go beyond those uh, line by line job duty job ads uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, it 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 is it does not differentiate your job from any other job in terms of interest. But also, you're going to get resumes and cover letters that are completely tailored to every job duty that, that is there. And it makes the vetting process that much more difficult. So rather than do that, focus on expected results for the job. It's going to be more inspiring and more compelling to, uh, to people who do that job. And paint a picture in a day of life of, a, of an employee doing that job. So you give a window into kind of what, you're, uh, what it's like to work for your company. But definitely stay away from the line by line job duties. Yeah, and our next point gets just a little bit technical, but really you want to be able to you want to remove the the risk of having dead links, right? So expired jobs leave kind of a page not found error. That's frustrating to candidates. Um, so you want to be able to use your Google Webmaster tools to check for those. Um, also, uh, you know, want to be able to create redirect pages. So if there is a dead link there, it kind of funnels them back into a maybe a job relevant page or a really much better experience. Um, and then this can also you can also uh, eliminate the risk. Uh, in, by having deeply integrated solutions for all of this as well. Great SEO your jobs. We talked about uh, a little bit on the on the maturity mo model. When you get to the point when you can SEO your individual jobs, in other words, optimize the the uh, the URL with keywords, optimize the headlines and job titles with keywords, make them uh, available and easy for both Google and, uh, and job aggregators to search, you're going to get a tremendous increase in traffic back to those, uh, to those particular jobs. And when you do that, you need to pay attention to, now that you've got your job on a search engine, how does it look once it, it's merchandised against all the others? Uh, you know, you may have a, a tech support person that you decide, well, we're going to merchandise it to solutions engineers because that's what it's more commonly titled. Now you're going to be in line with a hundred other solutions engineers on the first ten pages of a search. So, what is the the, the uh, meta description text that you put in there that makes it compelling enough for someone to click on that particular job? And again, make sure they're mobile because you'll get higher search rankings if your pages are mobile. Yeah, and I think it's important there, Ian, just to uh, again to point out that you did say SEO your jobs, uh, not just your career site, but your jobs as well. So, so a lot of your ATSs won't be able to do that. Uh, so you want to make sure that if you're using, um, you know, a, a well, our telemetry tool can certainly do that, but you want to make sure that you're getting that uh, out into the job pages, not just the career site. Um, and then here's, you know, here's a pet peeve. We could talk about this for an hour. Make those applications short. Um, you know, I'm I'm old enough to remember when we couldn't take applications online. I I um, I, I helped implement the first applicant tracking system for uh, Thomson Reuters out of New York, and you know we couldn't even take applications online. We could email 
uh, resumes in, and people never filled out a complete application until they sat in for an interview. But now, because we can do it online, we take way too much data. Uh, the application rates, uh, you know, can be as low as 10% or less because people know they don't want to go through this whole huge uh, process. So if you can, uh, you know, make it really simple. Uh, you know, maybe all people have to do is add their social profile and some EEO data. Boom, you're done. Come back after a full application if you need it later on down the process. It's going to help you drive a lot more uh, applications and a lot more satisfaction. And then that's right along with that, you know, build a talent network, uh, create an easy and casual way for people to engage with you. Not everybody's going to engage with you on an application level. Maybe they don't see the job they want right there um, within your jobs or or maybe they're just not ready to apply but they're interested in your company. Um, so get a very prominent button. Um, again, let them use resume or social profile extraction to, to just one click provide you with enough information that you can uh, not only know who they are but source in the future as you're looking for candidates proactively um, and, uh, and, and use that as a source for, for, future, for future hiring. And again, it goes back to thinking like a marketer. Again, marketers, we're concerned with building our database so that we have a growing pool of people that we can then market to in the future. We know they're interested in us because we provide an easy way for them to engage with us. So that's the first place we go to, uh, to look for prospects for new sales. And then make it modern. We talked about the common design elements. Hero images, large text, fewer words, prominent calls to action. Uh, again, I can't say this enough. Web visitors are reading less and accessing the web via phones and tablets. So your career site should be evolving away from those brochureware sites where you have everything you can possibly write about your company on, on, the, on the multiple pages and multiple menus. You know, streamline it and uh, take advantage of how people are are, are interacting with the web today. So uh, this is a, a slide too that kind of gets down the, the technical realm a little bit, but you, you want to understand the referral path. In other words, where are visitors coming to your job from? And this can be a real challenge, particularly if you are an organization that's uh, you know using one vendor for, C, for CRM, using another vendor for job distribution, using your ATS for your jobs. Uh, it's very difficult to track unless you have a you know fully integrated recruitment marketing platform. Um, a lot of your candidates could find your jobs on sites that you would be embarrassed about. Um, and so you want to be able to know where they are, and there are some ways to control that uh, in terms of bot blockers, etc. So you really want to be aware from on the full uh, cycle perspective of where candidates are coming or what their experience is across that entire uh, realm. And if you can, regularly survey your applicants, right, uh, to find potential problems in that candidate experience that you can't see. Yep, again, that 97%, even within the, the, the ones that are on your career site, localizing problems where they might be on an unscrupulous site, providing sensitive information to that site, only to them, thinking they're applying for a job, only then to get dropped on your career site uh, at the front end of an application process. That's a horrible candidate experience that you really don't have a lot of control of, over unless you have a proactive strategy to understand when, where, and why it might be happening and, and then uh, preventing it. Uh, and this is fairly obvious, but you want to measure everything, right? This is another key to candidate experience. You can't improve the candidate experience if you aren't able to measure it, right? So measure, uh, it, you know, improvements that generate, uh, uh, you know, some benefits on the bottom line. You want to measure and refine, you know, basic key analytics, you know, traffic to the site, how much time people are spending on the site and where, uh, traffic by source, where they're coming from applications by source that might be different hires by source might even be different yet right uh, conversion rates right and break that down not just higher conversions but what are your calls to action and how are you pushing people uh, you know toward the ultimate yes uh, what are your drop-off rates you know by page how about by application process right what does your talent network look like in terms of you know how large it is and, and who's in there. These are just some examples. Uh, and again, it's a lot easier to measure these things if you're using a, uh, an integrated uh, platform. And just want to leave you here with uh, an example. This is a telemetry client of, of what I think is a pretty good career site that does a lot of things right. 
um, and kind of can give you some visual examples of what we've been talking about. So um, first of all, it's mobile. You can see the site on the left is the same site that's being rendered uh, in the little mobile window here up in the right hand corner. All right, so it's very, it's got a, it's got a menu up at the top that you can navigate through. The job search is front and center on the mobile site. There's information about, uh, about UPMC, and it gets you right into some branding videos if you don't jump right into the job search. So uh, it's definitely mobile, definitely mobile friendly. Um, if you look in the upper left, we've got targeted microsites. So as you click on that career pathways, there's multiple different pathways depending on what kind of job family you might be interested in. Um, so they're able to deliver subsites within this. That once you choose, I'm interested in, uh, in nursing jobs, well, we've got a nursing site for you. And we understand our personas and we understand who we're trying to attract. Um, so we've got content on there that, that matches that and we're measuring it all along the way. I happened to take this screenshot last week, which was um, which was uh, Veterans Day. So very smartly, they uh, they do do a lot of military hiring. So uh, they put a banner up there that uh, that spoke to uh, the military uh, portion of their targeting. Um, very timely, and uh, I'm sure was very effective for them for that week. They've got a big hero image. It's easy to get into that uh, into the particular um, uh, career site, and then. Jobs are front and center. Right at the beginning, the first thing that the first action you can take is get in there and shoot and search. Not only by keywords, but by location or by job family. Again, that targeting and those pathways uh, are being integrated into every single level of what they're doing. Then at the bottom, you'll see there's not a lot of text. It's a very short te uh, paragraph about UPMC, and we get you right into. Uh, and what I would assume is a rotating video um, spot there, right there as we uh, in, uh, uh, access the career site. Uh, there's a nursing video there. I'm sure they have rotating ones in, or perhaps nursing is their biggest need right now. So they're able to address that by bringing that content uh, front and center. So I think it, this is a, a very quick career site that does a lot of things right, and it's not that difficult. And it adheres to a very common design standpoint, but looks great at the same time. So that is our presentation. I just wanted to let you know, and we are, we've got one minute left. Um, all of you are going to get a link to our candidate experience strategy snapshot, which has a lot of this information into it, in it. We'll also send you a link to the archive of this presentation as well as uh, the slides as well. So all that will come to you. You don't need to do anything. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, telemetry and our candidate experience solutions uh, or our recruitment marketing platform in general, you can visit telemetry.com or you can email directly and I can point you, uh, email me directly, I'll point you in the right direction. Um, so I want to thank everybody for coming. Unfortunately, we don't have any uh, time for questions, but we do have some questions which we will email you out the, uh, our answers to. Uh, post uh, webinar. Again, on behalf of Stephen and myself, I want to say thank you very much and have a great day.